Refugee, page 34. Joseph, Germany, one home. The Hitler youth led Joseph down the narrow corridor of the German passenger car. Tears sprang to Joseph's eyes. The brown shirt, who'd taken his father away on Kristallnacht, had said, We'll come for you soon enough. But Joseph hadn't waited. He'd gone to them with this stupid stunt. They came to a compartment with a man in the uniform of the Gestapo, the Nazi secret state police, and Joseph stumbled. The Gestapo man looked up at them through the window in his door. No, not here, not now, not like this, Joseph prayed, and Hitler youth boy pushed Joseph on past. They came to the door of the Jewish train car, and the Hitler youth spun Joseph around. He glanced over his shoulder to make sure no one was listening. What were you thinking? The boy whispered. Joseph couldn't speak. The boy thrust the armband at Joseph's chest. Put that on and don't ever do that again, the Hitler youth told Joseph. Do you understand? I uh, yes, Joseph stammered. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The Hitler youth breathed hard, his face red like he was the one in trouble. He spotted the piece of candy Joseph had bought for Ruth and took it. He stood taller, tugged at the bottom of his brown shirt to straighten it, then turned and marched away. Joseph slipped back into his compartment, still shaking, and collapsed onto the bench. He stayed there the rest of the trip, his armband secured in place and as visible as possible. He didn't even leave to go to the bathroom. Hours later, the train pulled into Hamburg Central Railway Station. Joseph's mother led him and his sister through the crowds to the Hamburg docks where the ship waited for them. Joseph had never seen anything so big. If you stood the ship on end, it would have been taller than any building in Berlin. Two giant tan smokestacks stuck up from the middle of the ship and one of them belching gray-black diesel engine smoke. A steep ramp ran to the top of the tall black hull and hundreds of people were already on board milling around under colorful, fluttering pennants and waving to friends and family down on the docks. Flying highest above them all, as if to remind everyone who was in charge, was the red and white Nazi flag with the black swastika in the middle. The ship was called the MS St. Louis. St. Louis was the name of a city in America, Joseph had learned. That seemed like a good omen to him, a sign that they would eventually get to America, maybe one day visit the real St. Louis. A shabby-looking man stumbled out from behind the crates and lug luggage piled up on the dock, and Ruthie screamed. Joseph jumped, and his mother took a frightened step back. The man reached out for them. You made it! At last! That voice, Joseph thought. Could it really be? The man threw his arms around Mama. She let him hug her, even though she still had her hands across her chest as if to ward him off. He stepped back and held her at arm's length. My dearest Rachel, he said. I thought I'd never see you again. It was him. It was him. The shabby man who had lurched from the shadows like an escapee from a mental asylum was Joseph's father, Aaron Landau. Joseph shuddered. His papa looked nothing like the man who'd been dragged away from their home six months ago. His thick brown hair and beard had been shaved off, and his head and face were covered with scraggly stubble. He was thinner, too. Too thin. A skeleton in a threadbare suit, three sizes too big for him. Aaron Lando's eyes bulged from his gaunt face as he turned to look at his children. Joseph's breath caught in his throat, and Ruthie cried out and buried her face in Joseph's stomach as her papa pulled the two of them into a hug. He smelled so ripe, like the alley behind a butcher shop, that Joseph had to turn his head away. Joseph, Ruth, my darlings! He kissed the tops of their heads again and again, then jumped back. He looked around manically like there were spies everywhere. We have to go. We can't stay here. We have to get them on board before they stop us. But I have tickets, Mama said. Visas. Papa shook his head too quickly. It doesn't matter, he said. His eyes looked like they were going to pop out of their sockets. They'll stop us. They'll take me back. Ruthie clung to her brother. Papa was scaring her. He scared Joseph, too. Hurry, Papa said. He pulled the family with him into the stacks of crates, and Joseph tried to keep up with him as he darted from place to place, dodging imaginary enemies. Joseph gave his mother a frightened glance that said, What's wrong with Papa? Mama just shook her head, her eyes full of worry. When they got close to the ramp, Papa hunkered down behind the last of the crates. On the count of three, we make a break for it, he told his family. Don't stop. Don't stop for anything. We have to get on that ship. Are you ready? One, two, three. Joseph wasn't ready. None of them were. They watched as Aaron Lando ran for the ramp where other passengers had already queued up to hand their tickets to a smiling man in a sailor's uniform. Joseph's father threw himself past the sailor and stumbled onto the ramps, railing before righting himself and sprinting up the gangway. Wait, 
the sailor cried. Quickly, now children, Mama said. Together they hurried to the ramp as best they could, carrying all the suitcases. I have his ticket, she told the sailor. I'm sorry, we can wait our turn. The startled man at the front of the line motioned for them to go ahead, and Joseph's mother thanked him. My husband is just eager to leave, she told the sailor. He smiled sadly and punched their tickets. I understand. Oh, let me get someone to help you with those bags. Porter! Joseph stood in wonder as another sailor, a German man without a star of David armband, a man who wasn't a Jew, put a suitcase under each arm and one in each hand and led them up the gangway. He treated them like real passengers, like real people. And he wasn't the only one. Every sailor they met doffed his cap at them, and the steward who showed them to their cabin assured them that they could call upon him for anything they needed while on board. Anything at all. Their room was spotless, the bed linens were freshly laundered, and the hand towels were pressed and neatly stacked. It's a trick, Papa said when the door closed. He glanced around the little cabin like the walls were closing in. They'll come for us soon enough, he said. It was just what the brown shirt had told Joseph. Mama put her hands on Joseph and Ruthie's heads. Why don't you two go up onto the promenade, she said softly. I'll stay here with your father. Joseph and Ruth only had to, were only too glad to get away from Papa. A few hours later, they watched from the promenade as tugboats pushed the MS St. Louis away from the dock, and passengers threw confetti and celebrated the, and blew tearful kisses goodbye. Joseph and his family were on their way to a new country, a new life. But all Joseph could think about was what terrible things must have happened to his father to make him look so awful and act so scared. Page 40, Isabel, just outside Havana, Cuba, 1994. Isabel and her grandfather set her poppy in a chair on their little kitchen, and Isabel's mother, Teresa Pedron de Fernandez, ran to the cabinet under the sink. Isabel hurried after her. Mommy was very pregnant. She was due in a week's time, so Isabel knelt down to find the iodine. Isabel's father, Geraldo Fernandez, had always been a handsome man, but he didn't look it now. There was blood in his hair, and the area around one of his eyes was already turning black. When they pulled his white linen shirt off him, his back was covered with welts. Isabel watched as Mommy cleaned his cuts with a washcloth. Poppy hissed as she disinfected them with the iodine. What happened? Isabel's mother asked. An industrialist baseball game played on the television in the corner, and Isabel's grandfather turned down the volume. There was a riot on the Malacan, Lito said. They ran out of food too fast. I can't stay here, Poppy said. His head was bent low, but his voice was loud and clear. Not any longer. They'll come for me. Everyone was quiet at that. The only sound was the soft crack of a bat and the roar of the crowd on the television. Poppy had already tried to flee Cuba twice. The first time he and other th three other men had built a raft and tried to paddle their way to Florida, but a tropical storm turned them back. The second time, his boat had a motor, but he'd been caught in the Cuban Navy and had ended up in jail. Now it was even harder to escape. For decades, the United States had rescued any Cuban refugees they found at sea and taken them to Florida, but the food shortages had driven more and more Cubans to El Norte. Too many. The Americans had a new policy everyone called wet foot, dry foot. If Cuban refugees were caught at sea with wet feet, they were sent to the U.S. naval base at Guantanamo Bay at the southern end of Cuba. From there, they could choose to return to Cuba and Castro or languish in a refugee camp while the United States decided what to do with them. But if they managed to survive the trip across the Straits of Florida and evade the U.S. Coast Guard and actually set foot on United States soil, be caught with dry feet. They were granted special refugee status and allowed to remain and become U.S. citizens. Poppy was going to run away again, and this time, whether he got caught with wet feet or dry feet, he wasn't coming back. There's no reason to go throwing yourself onto a raft in the ocean, Lido said. You can just lie low for a while. I know a little shack in the cane fields. Things will get better, you'll see. Poppy slammed a fist on the table. And how exactly are they going to get better, Mariano? Do you think the Soviet Union is going to decide suddenly to get back together and start sending us food again? No one is coming to help us, and Castro's only making things worse. As if saying his name made him appear, the baseball game and television was interrupted by a special message from the Cuban president. Fidel Castro was an old man with liver spots on his forehead, gray hair, a big bushy gray beard, and bags under his eyes. He wore the same thing he did every time he was on television, a green military jacket and flat round cap, and sat behind a row of microphones. Everyone got quiet as Lito turned up the volume. Castro condemned the violence that had broken out on the Malacan, blaming it on U.S. agents. Poppy scoffed. It wasn't U.S. agents. It was hungry Cubans. Castro rambled on without a script, quoting novels and telling personal anecdotes about the revolution. 
Oh, turn it off, Poppy said. But before Mommy had reached the set, Castro had something said something that made them all listen up and we cannot continue guarding the borders of the United States while they send their CIA to instigate riots in Havana. That is when incidents like this occur, and the world calls the Cuban government cruel and inhumane. And so, until there is a speedy and efficient solution, we are suspending all obstacles so that those who wish to leave Cuba may do so legally, once and for all. We will not stand in their way. What did he just say? Mama asked. Poppy's eyes were wide as he stood from the kitchen table. Castro just said anybody who wants to leave can. Isabel felt as though her heart had been ripped out of her chest. If Castro was letting anyone leave, her father would be gone before the sun rose the next day. She could see it in his wild look. You can't go now, Lito told Poppy. You have a family to take care of, a wife, a daughter, a son on the way. Isabel's father and grandfather yelled at each other about dictators and freedom and families and responsibility. Lito was her mother's father, and he and Poppy had never gotten along. Isabel covered her ears and stepped away. She had to think of some answer to all of this, some solution that would keep her family together. Then she had it. We'll all go, Isabel cried. That shut everybody up. Even Castro stopped talking and the TV went back to showing the baseball game. No, Poppy and Lito said at the same time. Why not, Isabel said. Your mother is pregnant for one thing, Lito said. There's no food to feed the baby here anyway, Isabel said. There's no food for any of us and no money to buy it with if there was. But there is food in the States and freedom and work. In a place where your father wouldn't be beaten or arrested or run away. We'll all go while Castro is letting people out, she went on. Lito too. Oh, what? But I, no, Lito protested. They were all quiet a moment more until her father said, but I don't even have a boat. Isabel nodded. She could fix that, too. Without saying anything, Isabel ran next door to the Castillo's house. Luis, the older boy who'd saved her from the policeman's nightstick, wasn't home from work yet, and neither was his mother, Juanita, who worked at the cooperative law office. But Isabel found Ivan and his father, Rudy, right where she thought they'd be, working on their boat in the shed. It was an ugly blue thing, cobbled together out of old metal advertisements and road signs and oil drums. It barely qualified as a boat, but it was big enough for the four Castillos and maybe four more guests. Well, if it isn't Hurricane Isabel, Senior Castillo said. He had white hair that he wore swept back on his head, and even though there was no food, he had a middle-aged paunch to his belly. You have to take us with you, Isabel said. No, we don't, Senior Castillo said. Ivan, nail. People are riding in Havana, Isabel said. Tell me something I don't know, Senior Castillo said. Ivan, nail. Ivan handed him another nail. My father was almost arrested, Isabel said, and if you don't take us with you, they'll throw him in prison. Senior Castillo paused his hammering for a moment, then shook his head. There's no room, and we don't need a fugitive on board. Ivan looked at him funny, but only Isabel saw it. Please, Isabel begged. We don't have any gasoline anyway, Ivan said. He put a hand to the motorcycle motor they'd mounted inside the boat. We're not going anywhere soon. I can fix that, Isabel said. She ran home again. Her father and grandfather were still arguing in the kitchen, so she slipped in the back way. She grabbed her trumpet, gave it one long, sad look, and ran out the back door. She was already in the street when she stopped, ran to her backyard, and snatched up a little meowing kitten, too. With the trumpet in one and the kitten in the other, she ran a few blocks to the beach, where she banged on the door of a fisherman her grandfather knew. His gas-powered fishing boat gently rocked at a little pier nearby. The fisherman came to his door, licking his fingers and frowning. Isabel had caught him at dinner. Fried fish it smelled like. The kitten's nose sniffed eagerly at the air and meowed. Isabel's stomach growled. You're Mariano Padron's granddaughter, aren't you? The fisherman said. What do you want? I need gasoline, Isabel told him. Is it so? Well, I need money. I don't have any money, Isabel said. But I have this. She held out the trumpet. Isabel regretted that its brass was a little tarnished, but it was the most valuable thing she owned. The fisherman had to take it in trade. What am I going to do with that? He asked. Sell it, Isabel told him. It's French and old and plays like a dream. The fisherman sighed. And why do you need gasoline so badly? To leave Cuba before my father's arrested. The fisherman wiped his lips on the back of his hand. Isabel stood for what seemed like hours, her insides turning like a water spout. At last, he reached out and took the trumpet. Wait here, he told her. Isabel held her breath and soon the fisherman came back with two enormous plastic jugs of gasoline. Each one came up to Isabel's chest. Is it enough? Isabel asked. To get you to Miami? Yes. And back again. 
Isabel's heart soared and she hopped up and down. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Isabel told him. Oh, and you have to take the kitten too. She held the wiggling creature out to him, but the old fisherman just stared at it. Is that so? The fisherman said. Please, Isabel said, or else someone will catch her and eat her. But if you have fish to eat, she can eat the scraps. The fisherman eyed the cat suspiciously. Is it a good mouser? Yes, Isabel said, but she was sure that even a mouse would give the scrawny thing trouble. Her name is Leona. The old fisherman sighed and took the squirming kitten from her. Isabel smiled and noticed how big and heavy the gas cans were. Oh, and I also need you to help me carry these back.